it's an unspoken, unwritten rule in my office that I very rarely uh, travel to Gurgaon for an interview or any kind of event, but I make the exception for Arun because he is, he is a special individual, a former colleague and somebody that we continue to collaborate with. Uh, I've been uh, at the Tax Sutra Conclave, this is I think my fourth year, and Arun is very gracious to give us one of the most exciting topics to talk about. So I've done GST, we've done the transition to uh, INDS, we've done corporate governance in the light of the corporate battles that we saw and that was the discussion that we did last year. And today we're going to be talking about something that arguably is being held up as one of the most significant reforms that this government has taken forward, and that is the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. And as was articulated, it's been a little over a year since the IBC was put in place. There have been several amendments that have happened with the law itself, with the code itself. Uh, the question, though, is, is it going to change corporate behavior in the long term, and what will the implications be uh, in the short term? Also, uh, this is... a uh, a code that's evolving, uh, what needs to be done to ensure that it continues to be robust and what needs to be done to ensure that it works on the ground. That is what we're going to be discussing here this morning, this afternoon. Uh, so let me uh, request my panel to join me up on stage, Vijay Ayer of Deloitte. Uh, uh, Vijay uh, is uh, a resolution professional who has successfully overseen one of the most high-profile cases that have actually uh, been resolved uh, through the IBC. So Vijay, thanks very much for joining us. Also with us, uh, Anupam Rawat of Shardul Amarchand Mangaldas, uh, uh, partners in crime, so to speak. Uh, the two of them have worked together on several of the IBC-related matters. Gentlemen, thanks very much uh, for joining us. And we'll also be joined by Mr. Gautam Doshi uh, on video conference in a short while from now. Uh, Vijay, let me start by asking you, because as I mentioned, that uh, you have actually overseen uh, one of the most high-profile resolutions, and that has to do with Tata Steel buying out Bhushan Steel. Uh, now, just to set context of where we are, the Reserve Bank had identified 12 large assets that would go through the process of resolution as part of the first list. Here's where we stand today. Four have actually been resolved. One is headed to liquidation. On an average, as per the code, uh, the timeline is 180 days for resolution, and uh, it can be extended by about 90 days, so about 270 days uh, is what the code prescribes. Otherwise, uh, you head into liquidation. What we've seen so far, though, is that on an average, uh, it's taken about 333 days for a resolution to take place. But Vijay will point out that that wasn't the case as far as Tata Steel was concerned. So so Vijay, first, uh, the experience on the ground uh, in year one of the IBC, uh, what has it really meant? I have to use the mic. Thanks, Shireen. Uh, you are right. This is, uh, to my mind, one of the most outstanding reforms of this government. It has had a very positive uh, outcome so far. So I would say cautious optimism is mm. the phrase one would use at this point. Why are you time. cautiously optimistic? Why am I cautiously optimistic? Well, because of the initial success stories. Hmm. Ocean Steel, as you said, was a resolution which took place within the 270 days. It's a textbook case where the IBC code was worked out very well. Uh, there was very little litigation. There was hmm. a bit, but there was hmm. very little litigation. And why there's a degree of caution? Because the law has still to settle. There are three or four large cases, which is before, as you know, under litigation, there is the SR steel matter, there's the Binani cement matter, there's a the Bhushan power matter. So one of, one of, once these few large cases get settled by the Supreme Court and there's a better understanding of the law on the ground, then I'm sure that cautiousness would perhaps uh, go away and there'll be further optimism in the way we try and uh, resolve mm -hmm. the insolvency situation in the business profile. Okay, so we're waiting to hear from the Supreme Court on some of those uh, big cases and the way that the court will decide on those matters will prescribe the road ahead. But Anupam, let me ask you, what's been the experience on the ground uh, as far as resolution is concerned? And so far what we've seen is that it's the steel assets that seem to have got the interest. Uh, do you believe, are you also cautiously optimistic as Vijay is? And do you believe that we are likely to see the same degree of interest outside of uh, the steel assets? See, I think it's definitely, you know, uh, the, uh, the assets in the IBC space, they are attractive. Uh, one, because, you know, these are running assets. These are proven assets. Uh, and uh, any resolution applicant, you know, gets to operate it from day one. Mm. Uh, and the 
from a investor's perspective you know these are uh, uh, attractive because you know the haircut is uh, uh, presumably huge mm. uh, and you know there is a government support overall support uh, you know for making this happen uh, we have seen recently even the supreme court have you know upheld the law on two yeah. occasion yeah innovative is the one when you know they uh, had the chance to look at this law mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, recently in numetel uh, yeah an arsela case you know uh, we have seen that the supreme court have uh, 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 ensured that you know this works uh, outside uh, outside still i would say yes uh, you know we would also you know there is enough uh, uh, interest in those assets but you know uh, some of the uh, sectors which are affected because of uh, you know systemic uh, issues like power sector yeah where you have uh, issues on the coal linkages you have uh, issues around the off take agreements uh, i think those also need to be uh, 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 looked into and resolution on a stand alone basis may not be the solution having said that some of the initial power sector uh, assets which have uh, you know good uh, ppas and which have good linkages yeah they would definitely see a uh, price bit war uh, going on uh, you know for acquisition okay you know the point that uh, anupam made there that the interest that we're seeing both from domestic players as well as foreign players because these are running Uh, going concerns these are brownfield assets it's easier in india to acquire an asset than to actually start an asset so what does that mean then when it comes to the possibility of uh, haircuts and whether the banks are going to be able to take lower haircuts because of this that's a good point in the sense that if we see a higher interest of overseas funds coming into the country then i would suspect that once there is more competition from the buy side for these uh, assets then the haircut would definitely diminish and for the overseas interest to increase uh, there is a, there's a requirement that you know the law stabilizes mm. the positive message has been that now i know the tax colleagues would be heartened to know that timelines are now being adhered to in india you did say that it is it's not taking 180 days it's not taking yeah. 270 days but it's still days where we are used to years mm. in india But that's only. But, but we've only seen four move ahead out of the twelve. But it's still months. Okay. And, the, and you know the Supreme Court most recently said that timelines need to be adhered to. Mm. And I'm sure the other, the the, the lower judiciary, the NCLT, NCLT would respect that the uh, the the opinion of the Supreme Court. So once we see timelines being adhered to, once we see process being followed and the rules of the game not being changed. Yeah. i'm sure maximization of value would carry out so so there are two separate points that you're making there one the need for stability and consistency as far as the law is concerned we've already seen several amendments coming through i'll address that in just a second but the other i want to talk about because you feel fairly confident that we will be able to meet the timelines that have been prescribed in the code and i ask you that because there are question marks on the capacity of the system to be able to deal with it if you look at about the number of cases that are at the nclt specific to the ibc of the 9000 cases that the nclt deals with 2500 are just the ibc and you have 11 nclt benches across the country and that's where the skepticism arises that are you going to be able to meet the timelines forget litigation in the higher courts yes and why do i say that is because this is still an evolving law so once the supreme court lays down the law in some of these three or four fundamental cases automatically quite a few of these issues which are there before the nclt and the nclts will get resolved and would not need to come up again the supreme court has said uh, again in the latest sr steel judgment that they would like to see less interference of the nclt and clat in this entire process they would like to see a resolution plan being approved by the committee of creditors put forward by the tribunal and only then should any litigation start mm. and once the other like i said the lower judiciary starts understanding appreciating what the supreme court has viewed I'm, I'm sure that most of these cases should go away. Okay, so that you continue to be hopeful on that. Let me bring in Mr. Doshi as well. Mr. Doshi, let me start by asking you. Uh, you know, as I said, 
that uh, most people believe and argue that this is a game changer, that the IBC is not just going to change corporate behavior, it's going to bring errant promoters to book, it is going to uh, help in a long way uh, address the issue of non-performing assets and the build-up of non-performing assets. What do you believe is the most significant impact of being able to push the IBC through? As you rightly said, I think the biggest impact is the fact that productive assets will continue to produce where they would otherwise have stopped, they will continue to produce for the country. Doesn't really matter which promoter runs them. That is not it really It matters relevant. to the promoter, sir. <laughs> it matters to the promoter. It causes tremendous pain, shifting from promoter A to promoter B. But overall, it achieves the main objective that you have productive assets which produce, which virtually service banks to the extent that they can, which service finances to the extent they can, and thereafter service the promoters. So that, I think, is really the key heart of IPC. Mm. The fact that you allow industry to continue to function through the CIRP process and almost immediately thereafter also. That is really the key. Okay, let me ask you, since you spoke of promoters, and I'll get uh, all three of you to comment on what has been the most contentious uh, uh, provision of the IBC, and that is Section 29A, uh, and of course there have been amendments made to exclude MSMEs from that, so there is some degree of relaxation given to MSMEs. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the promoters who find themselves in the midst of this process would argue that, look, if you're not a willful defaulter uh, and you've had to go through a process of a down, down cycle in commodities or whatever the case may be and you have been servicing your debt as best as you possibly can, should you be excluded from being able to bid for that asset yet again? Uh, do you believe that Section 29 uh, requires review uh, uh, or do you think that it is an outcome of the times that we live in because this has become such a deeply political issue as well? I would agree with you. I think it requires review. But the real issue, as you rightly said, is the feeling that promoters who are responsible for the loss are getting away with it by getting their industry back at a discount. And the feeling also that it is very difficult to prove when the loss is willful and when the loss is on account of circumstances beyond their control because of business factors. Mm. Now, one is not able to establish, one is taking a very, very drastic position that in almost every case of loss, you are assuming the promoter is responsible and he should not benefit and therefore you have a section like 29A. But this is true, I think, of a lot of our laws today where we are making assumptions across the board and to an extent anti-business, anti-promoter. Mm. Now, whether this will continue or whether this should change, as a, I personally feel it has to change. Fairness has to be there in law, whichever be the position, and merely because investigative agencies or other agencies are unable to carry out some of their functions or unable to establish certain things, one can't make extreme laws. Mm. And perhaps, given some time, even this extreme law will get modified. Okay, that's your hope. Uh, let me ask Vijay if, uh, if he shares that hope as well. Uh, Vijay, you know, the point that uh, Mr. Doshi made, that a lot of our regulation and a lot of our legislation is also sometimes reactive. I mean, we saw that happen with corporate law on account of what uh, Satyam went through, and perhaps we've seen that as part of the IBC provisions as well, uh, taking into account the climate that we've seen over the last few years. Do you believe Section 29A uh, deserves to be reviewed, or do you believe that for too long, uh, promoters have gotten away with murder in India and deserve to be punished? That's a difficult question, so I'm going to try and find a middle path. Our, <laughs> RPs, RPs are used to dealing with difficult questions. <laughs> well, I like to put it in context that the, the law as it may have been legislated looks difficult, but the law as it has been interpreted by the judiciary system and by the Supreme Court, I think has helped ways. Mm. Uh, even if the most recent judgment I think the principles of natural justice and fairness are actually being re-enunciated. And even the Supreme Court has said, you know, if there is an issue, if you are ineligible, they're trying to find a cure. 
Mm. You know, they're in the most recent case, they have allowed the bidders saying that you have this period of time, yeah. make good your ineligibility, yeah. and come back into the game. Mm. So I think that's fair. And I'm sure, obviously, yes, I do, to some extent, do echo what Mr. Doshi said, that there will be some degree of uh, review required if we find some of the provisions being too stringent. Mm. But at this point of time, uh, one would suggest that we go by what the law is, uh, a degree of stability in the law does help. Uh, the rules of games are firm, and you would obviously get far more interest once that is there. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, Anupam, for your point of view on 29A specifically, and whether there is cause for review, and what would you like to see change, if anything at all? Uh, see, I think it definitely uh, needs review. But, you know, uh, I think it's too early to... Uh, comment given the, the kind of cases we have uh, because you know these are the cases where uh, efforts were made to uh, restructure the loans, resolve the debt and a lot of time was given to the promoters mm. and these are the cases uh, you know which are under stress for several years. Yeah. And despite so then you're basically saying it's only fair it's that the promoter pays the price for uh, for not being able to having done what they ought to have done. Correct. And I think going forward, when, you know, uh, we have a robust mechanism uh, of, you know, how the lendings are done, lendings are made, and then, you know, limited uh, restructuring opportunities are given, perhaps then the, you know, the existing regime on ineligibility would also Change. Would change, but so, you're saying that for now, for, for now, now it, 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 yeah. it, uh, it merits staying. Uh, the other question that I want to ask you, Vijay, and uh, you know, share with us your experience as a resolutional professional. Uh, I, I believe India has 1,000 plus RPs today. Uh, we've seen some high profile changes of RPs and some high profile cases. And uh, you know, there are always sort of one party is, is questioning the RP, the other party is questioning the RP. So you can, you know, you, you, uh, you find yourself in the crosshairs, so to speak. How difficult is it for you to be able to negotiate uh, these large deals? So I could Thanks, thank you for that empathy and sympathy. I, I empathize with you because we go through exactly that. We can make nobody happy. So I understand what an RP must go through as well. The RP has very few friends. You're, you're very right. Because if there's many people who can get disgruntled with the way the process goes, it requires many things to go right for it to be successful and very little to go wrong for you to fail. And that's the, that's the role of an RP. And any disgruntled resolution applicant, the, the promoter who, who's, who's let go of his company, uh, the, the financial creators believe you're in collusion with the promoter, mm. the promoter's upset with you, but you've taken away his company, uh, the operation creators believe that you're biased with the financial creators, uh, a resolution applicant challenges you because you seem to be uh, having a collusion of interest, mm. or you may be partial to one of the other resolution applicants. So you have very few friends. Uh, what is required is, again, which the courts have again suggested, is to demonstrate of a high degree of transpar transparency. We have been able to do that in our cases. Uh, to show that you have been unbiased, you require a very consultative, collaborative approach mm. so as to reduce the level of litigation. And do not change the rules of the game mm. as you move forward. So speaking of changing the rules of the game, and since you spoke about the fact that by bringing in uh, adequate transparency in the way that the process is run, you will do away with some of the, the, uh, the charges of collusion and so on and so forth that RPs are having to face with. Should there be the allowance for revision of bids while the process is on? We've seen this happen with high profile cases, whether it's Dalmia and Binani Cements. We've seen it happen as far as Ruchi Soya is concerned. I mean, those are the two high profile matters in where we have seen bids being revised while the process uh, is still underway. Uh, do you believe that, that there should be a limitation on being able to do that? Again, a difficult question, but I'll try and give you an answer. Yes, I think. At the end of the fundamental objective of this code is maximization of value of the corporate debtor. Not maximization of value of financial creditors, but maximization of value of the corporate debtor. So that you have a sustainable, feasible resolution going forward. As Mr. Doshi said very correctly, that you want these assets to be you know, fruitfully used. So if you have that as your paramount objective, 
Revision of bills should be allowed, provided again, you have all players consenting to it. Mm -hmm. It's within the timelines again. And it's not that you're depriving anybody of their interest when you're trying to do this. If you have, again, a collaborative consultative approach, it is transparent, you have everybody buying into it, then yes, then you are achieving the opti ultimate objective of maximization of value. Okay, so since we're speaking of maximization of value, sir, and one of the criticisms, uh, in fact, this has been something that uh, Mr. Sahu of the IBBI has also raised is uh, that should the committee of creditors merely look at maximization of value or should they be able to balance uh, interests of all stakeholders involved in the process? So one to the point that Vijay was making on, you know, specific practicalities of should you allow revision of bids while the mandate is still uh, on, uh, and, you know, what should be uh, the, the thinking when it comes to this business of maximizing value and balancing it with the interests of all stakeholders? Yeah. Uh, you're asking me, uh, me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think one has to achieve maximization of value is more important. But maximization of value is not just value as which I just explained, it is achieving a sustainable business. And therefore, it also requires, as you said, fairness between how much are you going to give to operational creditors, what are you going to pay for the others, how are you going to deal with the various stakeholders. And some of those questions are going to become very complex going forward, mm. particularly the relationship vis-a-vis -vis statutory creditors is not clear at all. Yeah. Because they have a variety of provisions under which they'll be able to enforce their powers, maybe even post-resolution. Therefore, you now the business is to sustain and does not have the ability to meet those liabilities, mm. again it will fail. So what we are talking about maximization is not just the absolute number, but the division of that number between the various stakeholders. And if for that purpose, the rules of the game need to be tweaked. I think one can't be a prisoner of the rules. Mm. So long as one is transparent and fair, rules can change. And that is for the COC and the RP to do. Mm. It should not go and trouble the NCLT yeah. and LAT. Yeah. And that is what the Supreme Court has state, stated in its latest judgment. And if they can achieve this, there should really be no difficulty in doing it. How much, how much of this is going to be uh, uh, helpful in being able to avoid significant time loss on litigation, etc., as Mr. Doshi was pointing out, that between the COC and the creditors, resolve it, sort it out, and then go to the NCLT. And the point that Vijay was making, now that the Supreme Court has pretty much weighed in on this, uh, does it address some of the concerns on litigation and the time loss on account of that? Yeah, significant. You know, uh, we have seen, you know, cases where the resolution uh, could not be completed because various stakeholders have, you know, intervened and have been able to get uh, you know the stays stay or injunction from the nclt or nclat uh, unfortunately there is no consistent stand taken by you know various adjudicating authorities on some of these issues and that is what adds to the confusion mm. uh, and therefore i think uh, supreme court has rightly said that you know the coc and rp should be allowed to function uh, they should reach a stage where there is a plan on which there is a voting done. Yeah. And that becomes the cause of action then mm. for anyone to approach NCLT and not before that. Because everything in between is just the, you know, uh, just a stage where nothing has been decided right. yet. So creating a stumble at that point of time derails the whole process. Mm. And what is very, very important to also consider is that, you know, in this whole uh, resolution process, the lenders uh, or for that matter any other stakeholders uh, uh, servicing of the debt mm. is not happening. Okay. So there is a moratorium. Mm. So the time loss is also a loss of yeah. the val time value of money. Money, yeah. So imagine a, uh, you know, imagine a resolution process which should have been completed in 270 days. Mm. It is still continuing in the 350th day. Yeah. Yeah. It's the value loss for lenders. Mm. So, and to that extent, I would say that, you know, even the value maximization has to be understood in that context. Therefore, the certainty of the process yeah. uh, 
and keeping in mind the return of the all the stakeholders in a mm. time bound manner mm. that is very important and to that extent i i completely agree that it's a, it it makes a significant difference where a certainty is given to the process and the triggers for the challenges are defined okay uh, so you know and this brings me back to to the question that i asked you vijay on 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 the skepticism with respect to being able to meet uh, the timelines but i also want to ask you about how we are now aligned to what we're seeing as far as cross border insolvency is concerned uh, since we are expecting foreign investors to come in and pitch for these assets whether it's uh, companies themselves or via the arc route etc so what are, what are you seeing on the ground with respect to that overseas investors are quite positive about this whole process uh, because they are saying you know the two positives have actually been the you know the adherence to timelines and the point which you made there have been multiple amendments but that has been actually looked at quite positively because one has seen that these amendments have only gone to facilitate the process better mm. and once we see a stability in terms of the process now then one would expect to see a larger amount of interest coming in and uh, yes and as the rules for cross border insolvency gets established the rules for individual insolvency gets established then one would expect that IBC would be one of the most radical reforms of this government you know since we're in the heart of the national capital region and and this is where you are seeing a lot of stuck home projects so let me ask you what the IBC has done and this is by way of an amendment uh, to uh, to classify home buyers in the creditor category as well now in some sense uh, it gives home buyers a stake in the entire process but it does it also make it more challenging therein and is it also going to then elongate the timelines further like again i use the phrase of cautious optimism i i'm optimistic because the government has uh, addressed the need of the home buyers they wanted a voice at the table uh, they needed to be part of the committee of creditors uh, the, and it, i do believe this is a positive step that now they are very much part of the process while they were not part of the committee of creditors they were quite uh, unaware of what the actual happenings were happening once they are part of it they are not going to be part of the deciders because the committee of creditors has to vote on various items i would expect that they would be far more involved and they would be far more proactive in trying to find a solution the the challenge which we'll have you're right where there's a degree of caution is to aggregate the yeah. home buyers all together i think there's been a recent uh, judgment by the nclt and i'm i'm sure anup will throw for the light where the nclt is also given up some guidance of it's not necessary for all the home buyers to vote but one looks at tries to understand who have who have voted and what has been that uh, the the view from that majority mm. of those who have cast that vote because it's like shareholders of company everybody believes somebody else yeah. to do the job and they will not vote but once these rules again are decided i would expect it again to be very positive for this okay but in the interim what will the practical challenges be anup practical challenges would be see now we have a very uh, 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 different scenario where you know unlike the typical committee of creditors who are there in their fiduciary capacity you have the home buyers who are keen to resolve their own in, yeah. you know uh, yeah. problem so you will have this conflict of approach mm. where you know the resolution professional uh, will uh, you know at the one end of course he'll have to look at the resolution as a whole yeah. but they have that interest group uh, who want a resolution for that particular interest group alone mm. but they're at the same time in the fiduciary capacity as well mm. which it is very difficult for a uh, you know a, a home buyer to understand mm. so i think that challenge uh, 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 you know that will be the challenge he's, he's looking at you uh, when he when he says that that challenge which are you are you underestimating that challenge <laughs> i hope not uh, i i would like to think that uh, that because I, why am i optimistic again is that the entire system wants to make this work sharing uh, it's not just the legislature uh it's been the regulatory authorities have been very positive to it the judiciary has been very positive uh the financial creditors the entire banking sector who have been part of committee of creditors are quite keen for this to work and given that level of uh, mm. op positive optimism there i put it uh i'm confident that uh, there would be a consensus at such committee of creditors it might be a challenge but one one would expect to cross it okay.
Mr. Doshi, let me ask you, sir, as we now look at uh, the road ahead as far as the IBC is concerned, and as Vijay pointed out, that perhaps uh, it would be prudent to, to uh, exercise a degree of caution to say how successful IBC has been in its first year. But what do you believe IBC 2.0 needs to now keep in mind uh, regulators, policy makers, uh, the judiciary, as we try and evolve the code, sir? I think they need to try and now they know in this one year what are the likely issues. Some they have already resolved, but they have not resolved all the likely issues which have come up. Mm. They also now know the questions which are going to come tomorrow, including, for example, the home buyers, but as I said, statutory issues and a variety of other issues. It is time that we clarify those in advance mm. and so that IBC2 is far more successful than. IBC 1, or that even what has been achieved in IBC 1 is not undone to an extent because of the problems which will now arise in respect of how to implement those uh, resolution plans. You have now provided for a year for uh, uh, implementing them. Yeah. But, but even that year may not really be enough. So I think the real focus now is going to be on implementation of resolution plans, mm. issues which will arise in the course of implementation and solving those issues. Okay. You know, you spoke of certain clarifications that will be required and I, I, I think that another area, and I'll ask the three of you to weigh in on, on that, uh, is, uh, you know, with respect to the rules governing group insolvency, for instance, when you have one or two subsidiaries, uh, you know, uh, 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 having to go the IBC route, what kind of clarifications would you require at this point in time on account of that? I think in a group insolvency, again, one would need a degree of clarity, but not so much of a problem, because after all, each company is a standalone company also by itself and has to resolve its issues. Now, you do need to know which one will come first. The subsidiaries, are, they are not resolved what will happen to the mm. holding company and vice mm. versa. Yeah. But beyond that, perhaps, I don't know whether there is any special problem which one is facing because of okay. groups. Okay. One is used to them as part of the corporate culture and the way in which they work. Okay. So, not, not much of a challenge here? Uh, well, I'll just take the other question, you know, IBC 2.0. Uh, there is some items which are work in progress. I think Mr. Doshi put it brilliantly that implementation of the resolution plans. Uh, from a tax point of view, it's residual, li residual liabilities which are left, uh, while the resolution plans may be very explicit and clear that all contingent liabilities, all liabilities up to the date of the resolution plan stands extinguished once yeah. the NCLT gives its order. And if the NCLT order, again, is very clear, hopefully the level of litigation is not there where the tax department tries to pry the back door open once again and go back, hopefully, and we will see. I am confident, like I said, the system so far has been quite supportive, mm. and one would expect... But the tax that. department has a mind of its own. <laughs> we shall see. The other element is uh, on the whole dimension of balancing of interest, as you said. Uh, while there seems to be some, some view that the financial creditor seems to be there's a higher bias. Mm. So there is a degree of uh, correctness when you said, you know, the home buyers have been brought in. The other issue is on the small, medium, medium-sized operation creditors, mm. uh, whether they're getting a fair deal, whether de they need a voice on the table. And the other issue which may be perhaps open is, you know, contractual workers. Then they are in substance equal to workmen and employees, yeah. but they're actually treated as operation creditors. So to try and get them on par with employees, workmen, their rights, their, ob their claims are mm -hmm. also treated. That's one issue. The issue of uh, these liabilities, of tax liabilities being under the residual liabilities. Mm and uh, the smaller operation creditors. Okay. Yeah, see, on the group insolvency, uh, I think it's a very pertinent question, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, that aspect is completely lacking okay. in our code. Mm. Uh, because I think it's a great value erosion. If you do not recognize that, you know, uh, that the group has to be resolved together. Yeah. Uh, in most of the cases, you know, there are companies which have the forward integration or the backward integration. And if you take one company to insolvency, uh, without taking the other, without mm. at the same time, you know, resolving the other, then you are, uh, you know, it's most likely that, you know, you are going to get a, a larger haircut mm. as compared mm. to 
a situation where you take the entire group uh, together. Okay. And we have seen some of these cases. I think Lanco is, yeah. uh, you know, one, one of the cases where, you know, LITL uh, now is staring at the liquidation. Mm. Uh, it, the liquidation has indeed been ordered. We still do not have answers to what happens to the subsidiaries. Uh, similarly, you know, we have other examples mm. which are, you know, uh, ongoing and I cannot for the, because of the confidentiality, sure. should not discuss, but I think it's very, very important. So I think uh, consistency of approach is very important to keep the group together, mm. to preserve the value and then resolving them at this, you know, same time. It's very, very important. Okay. So that's something that we need to be mindful of. Mr. Toshi, you know, uh, uh, one of the aspects that we've seen uh, as a result, perhaps, of the IBC, uh, is the intent, the voluntary intent uh, and commitment of promoters now wanting to try and settle with banks before they come even to this uh, process itself. Uh, that, of course, is a very welcome change, sir. And do you believe that that is going to, once again, institutionalize good corporate behavior? It will also get banks to think about the manner in which they're lending and, uh, you know, especially the kind of irrational lending that we've seen, uh, how significant is this going to be going forward? Yes, certainly. I think this is one of the best things which is going to come out of IBC. And to that extent, 29A is playing a good cause because even though one may not feel it is fair, it is forcing promoters to think in advance and accept because they know that rightly or wrongly they will be kept out otherwise. So if they want their companies and if they want to succeed, they need to make compromises to the extent required, but make sure that they restructure in time, mm. that they wake up in time. Will the banks start looking at, let us say, haircuts or restructuring positively outside IBC is still a question mark. Mm. Because banks are extremely worried about the CVC, the CAG yeah. and the actions of the various authorities. Yeah. And therefore they feel very safe under IBC, mm. which they don't feel the same safety outside IBC. Mm. But perhaps if it also goes home to the banks, then together banks and promoters should improve their performance. Will corporate governance as a whole improve? Will promoters be more careful of what they are doing? Will they really change their attitudes? Mm. That I think is a far call and very difficult to say. Time will tell. IBC alone is enough for that. Well, we time will much tell. More to achieve that. Uh, but but may, but maybe it, it is uh, it is certainly the first step in trying to trying to bring in a certain amount of discipline when it comes to the manner in which uh, promoters have operated. But uh, Vijay, on the point that Mr. Doshi was making, uh, you know, on this business of the IBC sort of providing that legal protective cover, and hence the the possibility of bankers wanting to settle outside of the IBC as opposed to pushing everything into the IBC. Do you believe that that, given the, the current climate, uh, the possibility of res resolving stuff outside I is unlikely? Uh, no, I would think that it is, in fact, we, we are seeing anecdotal evidence now uh, where promoters are taking the first step, uh, keen for uh, one-time settlement, they're keen to restructure their loans, uh, they, they, and they, the, the kind of uh, one-time settlement they're offering is far, far, better than what a, a banker might see through the IBC process. But again, you, you do need to factor in the timeline, right? Mm. You, you still have six to nine months in the IBC code. If you're able to have a promoter uh, saying that, yes, I'm willing to pay a, a one-time settlement now and continue yeah. to fr fr fruitfully use the asset, I think that's a better proposition. If, uh, when promoters are coming up right now, I do believe there is a degree of optimism. And since we are, in the festive season of Navratri, <laughs> I think that degree of optimism is required. Okay, we'll, we'll try and keep the optimism going, but I also want to ask you on, uh, you know, as I pointed out, four have found resolution, one is headed to liquidation out of the 12 so far. The liquidation experience and what we need to be mindful of. Again, it's going to be early days. Again, it's required that, you know, the same principles, that you need to have a very transparent process, you need to ensure that you're unbiased, Again, collaborative and consultative is required. It, this is going to be the, you know, the initial days when the law is going to be interpreted. Mm. Uh, so again, you, fortunately, the, 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 the law as it's been interpreted by the judiciary so far has helped 
that the liquidator, again, is again like an officer of the court. So he does have a high degree of powers, rights, and responsibilities. So if they allow him to do his work and continue, and there is a degree of maximization in that time, then I think it will be positive. Okay. See, I think the preservation of the asset and the value of the business as a whole, I think if that can, uh, uh, you know, that can be ensured in a liquidation process, it will be a great achievement for the, you know, the uh, liquidation process for many of the cases which yeah. will now come. And uh, fortunately, you know, our regulators have been really proactive. Mm. And, uh, you know, there have been recent amendments to the regulations uh, where they have uh, allowed the sale of the uh, corporate data yeah. as a going concern in yeah. the liquidation phase also. Mm. It is yet to be seen because, you know, it's really difficult. Uh, uh, historically, liquidation means uh, sale of the assets and then dissolution of mm. the company. Mm. So we're talking of a very very, very different, uh, you know, uh, system than what we are used to mm. in a liquidation scenario. But it will be really great to uh, see that, you know, the value is preserved. Uh, and, you know, some of the, uh, you know, uh, factories, running factories, yeah. which can still continue, they continue even during the liquidation. Okay. Mr. Toshi, before I get to uh, the audience for questions, uh, you know, what do we need to keep in mind and uh, uh, what do we need to ensure that this works more effectively than the DRT process, that this works more effectively than the Sarfesi process as well? I think what Vijay has been emphasizing throughout, namely transparency and fairness in the process, whether it is COC, whether it is RP, whether it's NCLT. And once that is achieved, I would expect IBC to be a success. And I, presently, the one year's experience seems to suggest that it has been achieved to a great extent. Mm. And therefore, we should really be able to convert IBC into a success as compared to the others. The other factor about delay, litigation, those are already being taken care of. The Supreme Court is trying to curb it. Other provisions are trying to curb it. So those things which would otherwise come in the way are perhaps not going to come in the way. Mm. And therefore, IBC should work. Vijay? I think there's one underlying principle if all stakeholders are willing to go with. Mm. And I'll borrow it from you know, the China Belt and Board Initiative. Of course, judgment is still out if that initiative is right or wrong, but there's a fundamental, very good principle. And if all stakeholders are willing to accept this principle, the principle being that this whole process is mutual benefit, joint responsibility, mm. and a shared destiny. Mm -hmm. And if people understand that, that you're not working at cross purposes, mm. But there's a fundamental objective of a successful, viable resolution of the corporate debtor okay. for the benefit of all, and all are equally responsible, mm. then it will work. So mutual benefit, joint responsibility, and shared destiny. I think that that's a good note to throw this open to the, uh, to the audience. Anybody here uh, with a question for our panel? Uh, I, I know you're waiting desperately to get to lunch, but if anybody, anybody at all has a question, we'd be, we'd be happy to take it. Or have we answered all your questions related to the IBC? That would be a success of my panel here this, this afternoon. No, no questions? Okay, yes, please, Arun. Please ask. Now, my question is to uh, Gautam, but I think uh, a common thread has been aligning the various legislations. Uh, right now, uh, in, when it comes to tax law, uh, do you think uh, uh, the IVC uh, on a war footing overnight needs some changes to align it with the tax law? Any, any couple of things, even if you've spoken yesterday, we have a few more delegates today, you would want to talk about any changes, any amendments to IBC to align it to the other laws that need to be made overnight? Yeah, no, I think that is one area where I slightly disagree with Vijay, where he said that if a resolution plan provides that contingent liabilities are not to be paid or except to the extent provided in the plan and that all other liabilities come to an end. I am not sure that will cover tax laws. Because, and the provisions of IBC, which say that anything inconsistent in any other law mm. will not prevail, yes. will also not work because that applies to a provision of the code. It does not apply to a provision of the resolution plan. So whether now the company is a company, it mm. survives. Mm. Take, for example, tax laws, as I mentioned yesterday at the same conclave. 
tax laws have a provision like section 221 under which you can charge a penalty for non-payment or 276C where you can prosecute somebody for non-payment of taxes. Why should I not prosecute the new promoter for having proposed a resolution plan mm. which pays banks, which pays a variety of other people but does not pay tax? Mm. Clearly he is doing something willfully contrary to the tax laws. He should go to jail because 276C2 <laughs> provides for that. <laughs> so, so unless we amend the tax laws and take care of things like this, I expect serious problems in the future, the implementation. You, you just lost about half a dozen potential bidders <laughs> there. So, so they're, they're, they're like, no, why not? Mr. If, Mr. Doshi, if they're listening to you, uh, Vijay Ayer is going to be out of business. Yes, sir, go ahead. Mr. Doshi is the last word on tax. <laughs> but I do have faith in the, uh, the fact that it's a, it's a judgment of the NCLT uh, under, a, under the code. And once the judgment is under an act, hopefully there is, a, there is a demonstrable value. We had a judgment of the Supreme Court in Vodafone. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't stop the tax department. Well, you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. The tax department has the last word, and I think that's the point that Mr. Doshi is trying to make as well. But uh, no, so on a serious note, I mean, is this even coming up as an issue? Because while the code very clearly says that it prevails over all other laws, has this, has, have the implications of what Mr. Doshi is saying even been factored in, in any meaningful way? That will come about in the implementation. Okay. Right. As, you know, of course, resolution applicants have been, uh, are quite, been quite alert. Uh, they have been as explicit as possible uh, of defining all such liabilities. And of course, they have the, the people like Anup drafting it for them. Uh, it, and therefore, it's been quite elaborately that all liabilities up to this date, which resolution, would stand extinguished or it, stand, it stands resolved mm. in this manner. And the NCLT blesses it through its order. And if the order of the NCLT is also as explicit. And if it says that the, the corporate data, whoever comes in, is now going to be responsible for taxes from this date onwards, mm. then one would like to have a beneficial interpretation to suggest that, yes, it, it does stand extinguished. But like you said, if uh, somebody wants to have a more aggressive interpretation, then we'll have to see how it, it falls out. Okay. So, uh, final comments. And Mr. Doshi, let me start by asking you, sir. Um, you know, we're still on the road to getting the first 12 done. Uh, uh, and, and it seems fairly clear that while the first year uh, has reasons for us to be fairly confident that we've put in place a process that, uh, that will work, uh, time will tell how effective it's going to be. So the number one priority and the number one risk uh, that you foresee. The number one priority is trying to achieve the time frame which is prescribed in the court because unless that is achieved, we will not really be having effective resolution. Mm. You can't have a moratorium lasting forever. Yeah. You need to have a moratorium which is for a period of time. So that is one. And the number one risk is, I would think, issues like I just, what I just mentioned about tax. So clarification about the interaction of IBC with other laws and other provisions whether this is meant to be a break, that whatever happens hereafter is a new life for the company, mm. or it's meant to be a continuation of the company, we need to be clear, make up our minds, and then decide what the provisions are going to be. Okay. Uh, Anup, priority and risk. Uh, see, uh, the priority, I think, today is that, you know, uh, uh, the fundamental... Uh, uh, things like you know uh, how the process has to uh, has to run and the sanctity of the uh, same the legislative acknowledgement of it and uh, adjudicating authority upholding it mm. i think that is necessary today and that could also be the the, the risk as well I, ah, yeah, if we absolutely. if we see orders yeah. that uh, uh, that undermine what so far has, uh, has been the process. Vijay, priority, risk, and an honest answer. Uh, is 29A being gamified today? Uh, okay. The, that second question I'll duck. <laughs> the, the first one, uh, in terms of priority, I would think uh, establishing the rules of the game clearly once and for all and ensuring that all follow it. And all of us have got a shared interest in ensuring that it happens. And the risk is if that doesn't happen. And I think it's both together, it's a balance of, this, of the same coin. And uh, 
I do believe, I have greatest respect of the Supreme Court, and I do, and, and I will take that second question, therefore. And I have the highest respect for our judiciary, and I do believe that 29A will not be gamed. Will not be gamed. Well, uh, uh, we will see, but uh, Vijay, Gautam Doshi, and Anup, appreciate you joining us here to talk about IBC and the road ahead. And I think consensus on the panel that this is one of the most significant reforms uh, uh, that uh, we have seen being brought in over the last few years. The true test of its efficacy will uh, be told in time, but it's made a positive start. It's made a good start, and we hope that the momentum will continue. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.